Vertical Raise is the premier online donation platform, utilizing email, text messaging, and social media campaigns to exponentially increase the reach of your fundraiser. With detailed tracking and the complete personalization of every page, Vertical Raise provides an easy system that works. Our experienced representatives have made us the most effective fundraising platform available. We look forward to the opportunity in helping elevate your program to the next level and reaching your goals. Visit online or call today. This is a Queen Bee Radio High School Sports Presentation. Welcome to another edition of the Queen Bee Radio High School Sports Roundup presented by Vertical Rays Milwaukee. Got a great show lined up for you, including our one-on-one with a great one interview with Adam Guthrie, a licensed WIA official in this week's High School Official Appreciation Week. We also have the Subs.com highlight reel, the shoebox scoreboard covering all the action in high school volleyball, cross country, and girls golf. But we're going to jump right in with the recap of the past week's high school football action. I'm joined by Steve Prestigard, Tom Nysis, and Wally Troughton. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. And the token Platteville truther, Steve Prestigard, showcasing <laughs> his ceremonial banner. All right, let's jump right into uh, the uh, recap of the games that we had on Queen Bee. Tyler, I was going to have that tattooed on my arm. But... <laughs> Do you have the funds to, uh, to to pull something like that off in the uh, I, in I don't have the guts. I've got the funds, but I don't have the guts. <laughs> I don't know, but I want to be there if you had that put on your arm. I want to watch. <laughs> it's a badge of honor to be a Platteville Truther these days. So, yes. yeah, but... Yeah, let's jump into uh, the games that we had on uh, Queen Bee Radio last week. Let's go in uh, reverse order. So we'll start off with the game that we had on Saturday. It was a big one in the Six Rivers Conference. Potosi Castle defeating Blackhawk Warren 41-20. to Steve, you and Shark were on the call of that one. And uh, listening to the game, I-, I was surprised at how that game played out, especially in the first half with uh, Potosi Castle shutting out uh, Blackhawk Warren and really kind of setting the tone. Uh, in that matchup. I don't think we should necessarily be surprised that Potosi Cassville won, but just the way that they've won and how consistent they've been over the last four weeks uh, has certainly been impressive. What were your takeaways in that uh, matchup, Steve? Yeah, uh, their their defense absolutely showed up, uh, Potosi Cassville's. Um, they really uh, hammered them in the first half. And as far as their offense went, they played the kind of offense that you want to play against a team uh, like Black Rock Warren, which is don't let them have the ball. You know, they had two 80-yard scoring drives. Very methodical, went down the field, mostly running. But um, as it turned out, Braden Fishing probably had a career day uh, between running the ball and passing the ball. Uh, six of seven, very accurate, uh, threw a couple of touchdown passes, and really took the air right out of the sails um, of Black Hawk Warren, if I can mix metaphors there, in the first half. And at that point, you know, in the second half, they're trying to play catch up, and that's not an offense that can really play catch up. So, uh, certainly, biggest win of the year uh, for the Chieftains. A couple of late scores that made it a little more interesting than it actually was, perhaps. But, uh, you know, huge win for the Chieftains, absolutely. Yep, and that sets up a big matchup for them with River Ridge this coming. Uh, Friday night, we'll have that game on ESPN Radio, AM 1590, WPVL, and the Queen Bee Radio Sports YouTube channel. And again, Potosi Gasville controls their own destiny in the final two games of the season to come away with the Six Rivers title. Let's move into uh, the games that we had on Friday night. We'll start off with Platteville and Richland Center. Platteville winning 42 nothing. Steve, you were on uh, that one as well. And, you know, kind of an expected result, a, a blowout slash shutout win. Uh, for the for the Hillman and you know the beat goes on for them they've you know been on this roll uh, since the uh, Darlington game and and you know have basically flexed their muscle uh, yet again against uh, another SWC opponent yeah they got their their now that's their fourth shutout uh, I believe of the season they're back to number one in scoring defense in the conference and that was really what stood out it's bizarre to say this for a 42 to nothing score uh, but the offense took a little while to get going. They were a little bit off kilter, perhaps, in the first half. Uh, had a couple of series end without any uh, without any points. But the defense allowed 
Richland Center cross midfield once in the first half and once in the second half, and that was it. So, um, it, it, and and it, it, it took a while to get going, and I was really surprised when I saw the stats at the end of the game that, uh, you know, T.J. Pink kind of sort of didn't seem like he had the greatest game, and then he throws for 400-something yards, you know, and four touchdowns. And he is now, um, as a result of that, he is third highest in the state in pass uh off in a passing offense, according to uh, Wit Sports, which may not be a complete list. Uh, and I, now he's got 19 touchdown passes. He has not thrown an interception since the uh, uh, Broadhead Judy game. He is really on in uh, uh, right now. And, and, you know, obviously you need that with your with the kind of offense that Platteville plays. Yeah, but the Hellman have pointed this coming week and then River Valley to close things out, a, a pretty favorable schedule. Uh, for them the the rest of the way. And we'll talk about that point at game uh, in a little bit. Let's move into the game that we had on Super Hits 106 on Friday night. Darlington defeated Cuba City 23-7. to um, uh, Wally, you know, looking at how, you know, this game played out, I, I don't know if we should be shocked by the score necessarily. Um, I, I think everyone anticipated that Darlington was going to win, but in these rivalry games, um, where, you know, these kids know each other, they play against each other in, in, in multiple sports. Um, coming away with a, a big win like this for, for Darlington certainly helps their momentum out. And for Cuba City, you know, probably a better idea to kind of see, you know, where they're at, you know, late in the season as they get ready for some big games against uh, Fenimore and Mineral Point to get into the postseason. You know, I remember when the season started, um, Guy Kopp was concerned about some number of things. He said, this year we we ended up and we still got some skilled kids, but we've had some problems. You know, he talked about different areas where they were having problems and all that. And he said, it's a matter of getting it to come together. And it's it's come together pretty good. It isn't bad. It's not at Darlington level of good, but they're a lot better than I think that maybe Guy thought they would be at this particular point. Um, no, they weren't. Go- I don't think they were going to beat Darlington no matter what. But at the same token, they've come a long way. They really have. Darlington is still Darlington. No, we can't get mm-hmm. past that. I think Cuba City's been winning the games that they're quote unquote supposed to win, which which is certainly helping. And I think if you're, you know, competitive against a, a team like Darlington, one of the better teams in the state, I think that uh, certainly uh, uh, helps them out and probably even a little bit of confidence to uh, uh, help their team as long as they stay healthy uh, during what, these what final. You, what, what you were saying there is something I think is it's extremely important, and a lot of people don't think about it that, as much. I know and this was a quote from my coach in high school, and he said, you never, ever lose to people you're supposed to beat. Right. Make certain you win those games. The other games will take care of themselves based on that, and as a result, you'll You'll have better confidence. You'll play better. You'll do better as long as you remember that. Yep, absolutely. Let's move into the game that we had on 97.7 Country WGLR last Friday night. Lancaster defeated River Valley 35-6. to Tom and I were on the call of that one. And, uh, Tom, we were talking about this uh, a lot during the second half. It was how does Lancaster respond to that very emotional loss to Platteville, the week before a one point loss, a goal line stand on a two point conversion. And to to say the least, Lancaster did not flinch. They asserted their dominance right away and really set the tone uh, in that matchup against River Valley. Yeah, Nolan Wolf, I thought was fantastic again. Uh, nine out of 12, 139 yards, three touchdown passes. Taylor Williams. Uh, Logan Wolf and Quentin Plussell each caught a touchdown pass. Peyton Alvarado, 13 rushes, 167 yards and a touchdown. And he went over the 1,000-yard mark. I'm glad my numbers, I said that on the air. I'm glad I kept (laughs) decent enough stats that I was somewhat accurate anyhow. And congratulations to him. Uh, Defensively, they contained Andy Fiske, who is a very good back. Uh, who was going for a thousand yards and he did not get close. I thought Lancaster was very balanced, very efficient. I thought they looked really good. 
Yep, the evolution of the Arrow Raid offense uh, really, awesome. you know, showed itself uh, in that game. And, and you know, t- to be honest, I think it's just been a matter of how do you get those skill players involved more? I mean, yeah, Peyton Alvarado is reliable, you know, you know, being able to run it up the gut. He's, you know, very dur- durable, doesn't turn the ball over. But you got to find ways to spread the ball out. And I think over the last couple of weeks, it's been very impressive how the Flying Arrows have been able to incorporate the passing game into uh, their offensive arsenal. I think they cut it loose up at Mauston, Tyler. We did that mm-hmm. game. We've talked about that game already. But they really diversified up there. And I think they have gained confidence in Nolan Wolf being able to execute a more diversified offense. And that with that offensive line they have, which is very good, um, that makes them very difficult to beat. And they've cut down on their penalties and mistakes here the last three or four weeks. And that's awfully important, too. Well, that's yeah, one man. of the things with Lancaster. They are a high-risk offense. I mean, it always has been ever since John Hook showed up a number of years ago. But high risk can also be high reward. And they've seen their <clears> share <throat> of rewards based on that. And the thing that, you know, you mentioned the offensive line, and you have to believe that whether Lancaster, well, it looks like they're going to be in Division Six. Um, I don't think there's any Division Six uh, teams that have a flat out the sun size offensive line like Lancaster has. So whether or not they get a very high seed or not, that could be a recipe for them to make a trip deep enough into the playoffs that could surprise some people simply because they just grind it out against teams that are are pretty inevitably going to have smaller players on defense try to stop that running game. Yeah, I'm kind of kind of curious to see down the line once the uh, playoff pairings come out where they're at in the bracket in Division Six compared to where Darlington is because I'm hoping that it's kind of a one-two and that those two kind of have a path to meet up in a late postseason game, level three, level four, uh, somewhere in there. I think it'd be a shame if those two had to meet in level one or level two somewhere in there. I don't think they'll meet in level one, obviously, but but well, in the wisdom. Know, I'm sorry, Tyler. In the wisdom of the WIA, you never know. Remember, what was it, two years ago? We did a Potosi-River Ridge game, which was a level one game. That should have been a level maybe two, probably three. And they had those two matched up right away. So uh, nothing that comes out of Stevens Point ever surprises me. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Especially since no one understands how the formula works. So... Uh, and unlike our friends to the south of the state line, who let you know what teams, uh, you know, what their seating would be uh, at this point, they don't do that in, in uh, Stevens Point. And they will not let anybody know that until the uh, selection show comes up a week from uh, Saturday. So we all have to guess. Yep. So we'll have to see how that how that does shake out. But we do know that if Lancaster and Darlington were ever to go Head to head, that would be one heck of a Division Six um, matchup, and hopefully, you know, for our sake, we're able to see a quality matchup like that down the line. Let's move into the other games in the SWC. Prairie du Chien beat Dodgeville fifty-six nothing, and then Broadhead Judah took down Adams Friendship forty-two to twenty-one. I'll turn it over to Wally first. Uh, I don't think there's any real surprises, and you know, for the SWC, there really hasn't been that many uh, surprises as far as the scores. I think a lot of it's uh, kind of gone as as expected, but um, yeah, Prairie du Chien getting back on on the right track, and Broadhead Judah trying to uh, keep pace uh, in the SWC race, which you know they're going to set up a matchup with Lancaster in the final week of the season. When you turn around and look at it, and you look at Prairie du Chien and Broadhead Judah, you're looking at two very qual you know quality football teams. I mean, they're both very good, and you know it, I, it, you. Over the years, you've seen where this the SWC has been really good, and they've had then a couple of years where they've had just a couple of good teams. And but right now, you look at it; it's it's with four teams, you're pretty top heavy. There's some real good football being played there, and I, I'm not shocked at all with Prairie du Chien with their score there at all. And in fact, I think they were probably being pretty nice, you know, that they kind of called some things off. The uh, Broadhead Judah uh, game with uh, Adam's friendship 
that's interesting because Adam Friendship is not a bad football team. They're pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, one of the better teams in the South Central. But yet, again, it showed the strength of the SWC in comparison with that conference, which, again, is not a bad conference. Yep, certainly. And, uh, Tom, any takeaways from those other two games? Well, it, the, the SWC looks like it's Platteville's to lose, and I don't mm -hmm. think they're going to. Um, I, I, I'm looking forward to that Broadhead Judah Lancaster game for two uh -huh. reasons. Number one, it's going to be a good football game, two really good teams. But depending on how Stevens Point figures it out, that'll be huge for seeding. Mm -hmm. I mean, I got to believe some head to head matchup like that must make a difference. So it's for second place in the conference, probably, but it's also for maybe the right to play two more home games in the playoffs. So the four playoff teams, and you're right, it's Platteville, Lancaster, Broadhead, Judah, and Prairie du Chien. Those are four very good teams, you know, and uh, I suspect they're, they're going to do well in the playoffs. You know, over the years, you know, and I, I, I think back way back when I was coaching and we were paying attention, you know, as being a playoff team, and how are they going to work things out? How are, how are the matchups going to be? And they being here in the corner is makes it real interesting because you don't know if you're going to go north or you're going to go to the east. And if you go north, sometimes you get, there's a lot of benefits up there uh, because that quite often that took you into the Cooley Conference, maybe somebody South Central uh, as a way that it would start out. But if we went the other way, then you were looking at probably over in the Capital Conference or you were looking at, uh, back in those days, you were looking at some Rock Valley teams. Uh, you were looking at some different things over in there. Nowadays, it looks as if, um, WIAA has their mind made up that right along the line, within the first two rounds, Platteville and Lodi are going to meet each other. It's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I don't care if they shouldn't. It's going to happen because that's the way the WIAA does it. Well, there is one proviso to that. I was looking at the uh, Wisports.net uh, playoff field today, and I don't know why it didn't sink in until today, but I noticed Lodi is at the very bottom of division four, which right. means that if some teams bigger than Lodi make the playoffs, that could push them down to division five. And um, it's, I don't know how likely this is, but it's possible that Platteville and Lodi might not be in the same division. Of course, if that's the case, then good luck to Broadhead, Jude and Prairie du Chien, uh, if they have to play Lodi. But, um, you know, there's still enough fluidity in the next couple of weeks I agree that if they both end up in Division Four, they're most likely going to be in the same uh, the same bracket. And Lodi hasn't lost yet this season, um, but apparently there is at least an outside chance that that may not be the case. That they may end up actually in uh, Lodi may, would end up down in Division Five. And if that's the case, I have to believe Platteville's got to be a number one seed if Lodi is not uh, in that bracket of theirs. You know, it'll be interesting to see how many of those three win teams make their way into the postseason and how that, you know, impacts the, mm -hmm. you know, the cutoffs. Because there's a number of conferences around the state where there's teams right on that borderline. And, you know, some of those close games, depending on, you know, what the level of competition is and how much weight, you know, the uh, the computer gives to those quote unquote quality losses that has a significant impact on how that's going to play out. Well, one thing to keep in mind also is that the WIA, when they, when they create the brackets, they try to spread out the undefeated conference champions. And at this point, Lodi hasn't lost, but in the conference, neither has Platteville. So Wally remembers that the last time Platteville went to state in 2013, the bracket for Platteville actually was right along the state line. Yes. Uh, so the level three game was in Walworth at Bigfoot of all. Uh, of all places, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, but was, was it not last year that Lancaster and Kenosha St. Joseph were in the same bracket? And that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's not very regional either. So, you you know, anybody's guess is as good as anybody else's as to how they're going to create the brackets. But that does make the last two games really important for Platteville to be undefeated in the conference at the end of the season and force them you know, into a basically an automatic one or two seed situation. 
and I don't care what division you're talking about. What you just said there, Steve, has been going on for a long time. You know, yeah. where all of a sudden you're traveling forever. Uh, first round game. The Benton Zephyrs are over playing Burlington Catholic Central in a first mm -hmm. round game. I'm sorry. That's a little much. Uh, and I, I was disappointed with that. And then it turned around. And guess what happened the next year? Same thing. Exactly the same thing. Um, disappointing. But that's the way it worked. I've agreed. Let's move into the Swall. The only other two matchups. Well, there was really only one. It was Mineral Point defeating Belleville 35 nothing. And Fenimore getting a win due to forfeit by Parkview Albany. Uh, Parkview Albany uh, forfeited on Thursday of last week, and Fenimore wasn't able to uh, find another uh, opponent. There was literally no one else to play, according to uh, Travis Wilson. So uh, Fenimore gets gets a win. Mineral Point, a dominant win over Belleville, uh, 35 nothing. Um I don't think that's a surprise as far as the the score goes. Belleville has been, you know, kind of up and down, although more down than than up uh, most of the way through the season. But uh, Mineral Point asserting, you know, their dominance, and you know, like we said last week, uh, Wally second best team in in the Swall, unless Cuba City makes a case in the final week of the season. Mineral Point's a pretty good football team. Uh, we'll start by saying that. I mean, they're not Darlington by any means but they're a pretty darn good football team. And they've been improving as the year has gone on. You know, they were concerned at the beginning of the year, how well will, will we do? Well, the answer is pretty darn good. You know, you've come a long way from where you expected to be to start the year, because you had a lot of losses coming into the year with players that graduated and you've done quite well. So there's been some, uh, my compliments to the coaches and to the players over there, they, they've done well. I will push back a little bit on the, you know, they're not quite Darlington level. They played Darlington pretty tough, you know, last week against uh, the Redbirds. It was a 2013 final score, and it came down to uh, a touchdown sure. that Darlington had to score midway through uh, the fourth quarter. It was a very gritty uh, football game from what, uh, from what I've heard and, and seen. So I, I do think, you know, it'd be interesting. And, and, you know, I believe even last year too, Mineral Point, I think it was a 27 final score where Darlington beat – uh, mineral point in Darlington. So I think those two, I don't know if it's just stylistically or if it's just the way that, you know, those two schools, you know, match up. It's, it's not an easy win uh, for, for Darlington by, by any means. And I do think, you know, right now, mineral point probably playing with some, some confidence, especially after that, that win against uh, river Ridge, because they've looked pretty impressive ever since then. I think you hit the big thing, the idea of confidence and their confidence level is up. And as long as it stays up, they're going to continue to do well. And it, you know, it took Platteville a game, you know, a loss to Darlington at the start of the year to kind of figure out how to do things. And I guess probably just a mineral point two games, including their loss to Platteville. Remember, they got shut out in the second week of the season uh, for them to figure out how to do things the best way. And right now, you know, uh, mineral point certainly seems to be on a roll. Very versatile offense, um, and the defense is playing well right now. Yep, agreed. All right, let's move into the Ridge and Valley. We'll see if we can figure this one out. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know one thing. Basketball would love to be able to be playing Parkview Albany. Oh, I, I, <laughs> I'll agree. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to Jimmy and the Basketball people, but I had to say that. <laughs> Well, I mean, basketball is a fun team to watch, and, and they are still uh, looking for their first win. Um, I thought that they would uh, have a, a really solid matchup against Riverdale, but Riverdale did come away with the win, 34-6, to the final in that one. But here's where things get interesting in, mm -hmm. in the Ridge and Valley, because Hillsboro was undefeated in conference play heading into the week. And our friends from Seneca, Wazika, Stewin beat Hillsboro 18 to 14. Highland maintained their pace, beating Iowa Grant 31 to 8. And Bangor beat Ithaca 48 to nothing. Steve, we've joked over the last couple of weeks trying to figure out the Ridge and Valley is just something beyond any one of us can can comprehend. 
we just have to accept it for what it is. It's a very entertaining conference. It's probably evenly matched um, up and down. But, you know, for a Seneca Wazika student team that had not scored any points in, I believe, I know it was the first three games, and I think maybe right. even for their first five, they're all of a sudden the second place team behind the tiebreaker between Highland and Hillsboro, who, by the way, go head to head this coming weekend in the game that you will be doing. Anything? I can pick good games really well, can I, from August? <laughs> <laughs> I can't pick the Ridge and Valley well at all, but at least I can figure out what the good games are. Uh, I mean, you know, it's a, I can't explain it. This is The Ridge and Valley has been the least predictable conference that I think I may have ever seen. And it's, you know, I hate to put it this way, but, you know, the two first place teams, they're four and three overall. So, uh, and they've got the best record of uh, any of the, the schools in the Ridge and Valley Conference. So, you know, at the risk of saying something impolite, there's no outstanding team uh, in the Ridge and Valley Conference. But if you have a lot of even teams, then you do have, uh, you know, the possibility of, of unpredictability. I mean, this last week, going into last week, this was Hillsborough's conference to lose. And now all of a sudden, they're playing for the title Saturday when a week earlier, that didn't seem to be the case. You know, because Highlands lost a game they prob probably didn't want to lose in the conference. Now Hillsboro's lost a game that they didn't want to lose. You know, while Zeke and Steuben and Seneca and Ithaca both got off to unexpectedly poor starts. But now they seem to be getting it done. Uh, I, I don't know if this is mathematically possible or not. But maybe there's some sort of scenario where we end up with a four-way tie for first at the end of the season or something like that. That would be fitting. <laughs> Well, the word that yes, comes to, the word that comes to my mind is parity. Uh, mm -hmm. Walt uh, Roselle, Pete Roselle of the NFL would love this league. On any given Friday, <laughs> anybody can beat anybody. I mean, that's what the that's what has made the NFL millions. I mean, parity. No, not one team has won an out of league game. All their wins are within the conference which makes for an exciting conference race, but it does not bode well for a long tournament run because you're ultimately going to get matched up probably against better teams. I can't imagine uh, their seedings are going to be really good. You know, Highland has Riverdale next week. Uh, Ithaca's at Hillsboro. So I think Steve's going to see the winner of the conference title on Saturday, I think the Highland Hillsboro game is for first place. And I think that will determine the champion. And you know what? I've been in conferences that have been strong, conferences that have been weak. I don't care. If you can win a conference title, you cherish it because you don't get them every year. So, no. you know, it doesn't matter to me. The tournament's probably going to be tough for them. But you know what? They're going to crown somebody a conference champion. There's going to be a gold football somewhere in the hallway, and those kids should be proud of it. Exactly. And one of the great, yeah, and one of the great storylines about Saturday is that each of those teams, this is their last year because Highland is going to be an eight-player team next year. Hillsboro is not going to be going uh, – they're not going to go over to the uh, Six Rivers Conference. So one of those two teams – could end up could very well end up as the last Ridge and Valley champion. It's, yep. it's been an interesting conference over the years. And we've we've seen them play some different teams, particularly against Six Rivers, and it has not gone well for them. You know, and we if we remember back, Tyler, you know, the beginning of the year, River Ridge against Wazika, Seneca, Subin. Um, that was not a pretty game. Not by any means at all. In fact, we were, I was looking at saying, are these guys going to ever win a game this year? And all of a sudden, look where they are. But things happen. And some of it's the, conf the, conf the confidence you build when you're in your own conference, the confidence you build because all of a sudden something went right. And there they are. And Tom's absolutely right also. There is no asterisk on a conference championship trophy. There is no... Well, it wasn't a very good year in the conference, you know, or, well, they finished 
tied for first and they weren't, you know, all that good. When you get a conference title, it says conference title and nothing else. So exactly. That, that if, if, there is, mm-hmm. if there is no other motivation than that Saturday, that's the motivation. And well, congratulations let, let, to the champion, whoever it is. Yeah. yeah let, let, let's, let's point this out too. You know, the, the first two weeks of the season, you know, the non-conference schedules for those Ridge Valley teams for a bulk of them were pretty darn brutal. I mean, you know, Potosi Cassville had um, Ithaca and I believe uh, Seneca was Ika Stu, and I think those were two of, you know, the first games that Potosi Cassville had. Mm-hmm. So those are, you know, some tough ones. Highland had uh, River Ridge to uh, begin the season. So it's not like, you know, they weren't playing, you know, lower tiered teams to, to begin the season to, you know, give them the records that they have. But here's what I find very interesting in a and a story plot for the Ridge and Valley in the final two weeks of the season. Seneca was Zika Steuben is one win away from qualifying for the playoff. Iowa Grant and Ithaca are two wins away, and those two play each other coming up this Saturday. So there's a lot of meaningful football for a bulk of this conference, you know, the 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 rest of the way. And, you know, I I'm I think a lot of these teams are probably, you know, preaching that don't leave it up to the committee to see if you get in, win your games and win your way in. And that gives them confidence heading into a uh, potential postseason run. So I think it's, it's going to be a very fun finish to what's been a very frenzied conference and just ones that, you know, we we're just going to stop bothering trying to figure out, let's just enjoy it for what it is. I think we have to give the conference a, a cool nickname, like, you know, how the Sun Belt is sometimes called the fun belt. I think we have to come up with a cool nickname. We'll make a T-shirt for that, and that'll be something that uh, that we can start promoting on our on our high school sports roundup show uh, going forward. So, yeah, well, right. let's let's come up with something. We got to think yeah. about that next week. Yeah, the, the Ridge and Awesome or something like that. You know, we'll we'll just go with it. So, all right, let's move into uh, eight player football. Um, North Crawford defeated Belmont uh, twenty four to twelve. North Crawford stays undefeated. And now is the front runner in the Ridge Valley Eight Player Conference. Uh, DeSoto puts up a fifty burger on Kickapoo Lafarge, which you know you talk about an up and down team. DeSoto uh, being up and down, it feels like they're scoring you know forty fifty points at a time, or they're getting shut out. And then uh, Wisconsin Heights beat uh, Wanawak Weston uh, thirty four to three. Um, I will say one little nugget of information about the. Uh, the field goal being uh, kicked in that Wanawak Center Western game. That was a female kicker on the team that um, uh, converted the field goal. And I will say, too, uh, she did make the um, tackle on the kickoff against uh, Belmont. So she can uh, sh- she's a good all around football player. I'll I'll just uh, say that. Well, you, but, just hit it. you hit the most important things to say. She's not a novelty. She's a football mm-hmm. player. Yeah, she was not afraid to uh, get in there and 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 make the tackle. So that was a, a really cool thing to see. Travis Wilson posted the uh, uh, video of the field goal. Thought it was a really cool cool thing. But uh, looking at the uh, eight player conference, uh, Wally, you know, I thought last week between Belmont and North Crawford that was going to dictate you know what the conference was going to look like the rest of the way. Um, you know, North Crawford had been absolutely dominant. Um, I believe they were too, they outscored their opponents over their previous four games two hundred four to nothing. And now uh, to come away with a 24-12 win against Belmont, I thought it was kind of more of a test to see how good North Crawford really was. And it seemed like they answered the bell against a really good Belmont team. They did answer the bell. Uh, they really did. That's a very fine football team. And you know, when, it, when, when you're racking up points like that in eight-player football, the first thing you notice right away is whether you've seen any games or not, they have speed. They have to have speed to put up points like that. But that's the secret to that level, you know, a player football. Um, Belmont's not a bad team. And to be able to knock them off and to, you know, double their score, basically, that's, that says an awful lot for them. So my compliments read to North Crawford, get yourself in the driver's seat. Let's go for it. Take it all away. Yep, absolutely. And then, you know, DeSoto, that's a team that's, you know, you know, they're, if there was a Ridge and Valley team, it's it's them because it's it's either they, they're out, they're scoring at will, or they're just struggling uh, mightily offensively. I don't know if there's you know injuries or anything like that that factors into it. That's a team that, to me, just looking at how things shake out, 
makes zero sense. They, they only had 106 yards of offense last week, and now they put up 50 points in in this matchup. It's feast or famine pretty much for them, and I don't know when they do meet Belmont. I don't know what to expect in that game now. No, you don't know what to expect. That's just it. DeSoto is kind of a funny place because – you know, over the years, you think of all the times in 11-man football that they played for state championships. You know, so they've, 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 as a school, they've been in a lot of these situations. And now to be an A player and to be debating about who's going to be playing this week, and I mean by, is our team going to be playing or is it some fig, figment of our imagination playing? Um, hopefully, if the figment of imagination is playing well, that's who shows up. I mean... Go for it. I mean, yeah, I'm a Belmont fan. Of course I am. But at the same token, you got to cheer for some teams like that that have been struggling and then have been succeeding. So you got to cheer for them a little bit here. Yep. Yeah. yeah, North Crawford undefeated in conference play, undefeated overall, 6-0, 3-0 in conference play. And then it's a three-way tie for second between Wisconsin Heights, Belmont, and DeSoto. Wisconsin Heights and Belmont will play each other coming mm-hmm. up this uh this coming weekend. So that'll be a very interesting piece of the puzzle to figure out this uh, Ridge and Valley A-player conference. We'll see how it all shakes out. And before we wrap up our recap session, it's time for the Steve Prestigard high five. High five, everybody. All right. So (laughs) Steve, would you like to uh, run down your high five or do you want me to run it down for you since I have in front of me? Uh, actually, I have it in front of you also, and I'm going to do it in the order I should have done it in the first place, which is from the bottom <laughs> to the top. Uh, totally as to why I couldn't figure that out before. But So uh, Lancaster is in fifth place. They only have one loss. They're obviously a very good team. Broadhead Jude is in fourth place. They only have one loss, uh, and they really handled the team that's tied for first in the uh, South Central Conference Adams Friendship last week. Potosi Cassville. They're a third. They had their biggest win of the season uh, in beating Blackhawk Warren, really thoroughly beating Blackhawk Warren also. That's hard to do uh, against Blackhawk Warren, the kind of offense they play. I have Darlington in second place, and that means, is there a drum someplace? Um, the number one <laughs> side by team is Platteville. Um, they're playing, I think, better than anybody else. I, I kind of debated between having Platteville number one and Darlington number one, because Darlington did did beat Platteville. But Platteville has played a harder schedule. I'm not sure if Darlington has actually played. uh, I guess Prairie Sheen may have been ranked at the start of the season. Right. Yeah, they were. Um, But Darlington did not play the stretch of Broadhead, Judah, and Prairie Sheen, and Lancaster that Platteville did and went all three. So uh, that is my rationale that Platteville is uh, the number one team in the area. That's the rationale this week anyway, and they are certainly in the driver's seat to winning a conference title. It's right in front of them. It's Steve's like you and I were like, talking yesterday. It's the idea. Platteville ran the gauntlet and succeeded. Yeah, right. Yeah, Steve's ranking is kind of like college football. If you're going to lose, lose early because people tend to forget about that You know, as you start to win. So uh, that's kind of what's happened to Platteville. They lost that early game to Darlington and haven't looked back. Yeah, that was kind of a, that was kind of a wake up call for them right early in the season, and they made some adjustments based on that. Uh, they changed some things they do offensively. They changed a lot of things they did defensively, and it's obviously made a difference. Some good decision making there by the coaching staff. Yeah, and one of the big decisions that they made, I think, is to play as many players as they felt could produce. Uh, you know. So that when Garrison Castor goes down, well, they go from six receivers to five, which is more than most teams have. Uh, you know, they rotate three running backs. And I think really importantly, they rotate six defensive linemen. And as everybody knows, you know, playing defensive line is tough if you're playing against a team that rushes the ball like Broadhead Judah does uh, or a, an option team like Lancaster. Or if they find one, uh, a team that throws the ball because you're trying to pass rush all the time. Guys get wiped out from that. So the fact that they can have six guys rotating in the three defensive line spots and they don't really lose a whole lot when they go from the second group or from the first group to the second group, 
that says a lot. I think also in the back of the mind of the coaching staff, you know, if they just played the guys who have been, you know, getting all the stats, they could probably get away with it in the conference season. But when they're playing in the postseason against schools that are their size or bigger and have rosters that are their size or bigger, you got to have more people who can contribute. And really the only way you do that is by getting them out onto the field. Uh, so um, I think it was a, a calculated gamble on Platinum's part. It has absolutely paid off, especially with the injuries they've had the last few weeks. One of the things that uh, I learned a long time ago, and that is, is you need to have a number of players on your team to be able to pull that off. And you need not just that they're standing around on the sidelines and holding dummies. You need players. And the only way you get players is when you start young and you start building them up and you build it up. And let's face it, the kids don't go out for the sport to go sit on the bench and watch other guys play. You can do that in the bleachers. What you want to do is you want to get yourself in there. You want to have the opportunity as well. And the more kids that you have involved in practice, in games, the whole thing, the more kids that want to be there, and it makes you a much, much better team. I don't care what sport it is. Uh, it's all the way along. That's the secret to having success all the way along, year after year. Look what John Hope did. Look what's happening in, uh, for example, in the Potosi, Cassville. I mean, you've got a lot of kids. A lot of kids get in the game, and a lot of kids are involved in practice. That's the secret. Yeah, and I'll pose this question to both Steve and Wally. I did ask Tom this during our during halftime of our game because th this was a, a very interesting point, and it does tie into the text thread that we had about the high five for this week. If Platteville and Darlington played again, how different would the outcome be? I'll start out with you, Steve, since you witnessed the first one. Oh, I think it'd be a whole lot closer. Um, you know. Darlington is still, I still think that that defense is uh, an amazing defense that they have in Darlington. But you notice they have not been shutting out people to the extent that Platteville has. And, uh, you know, admittedly, you could say, well, Richland Center's not very good. Gotchel's not very good. And our point hadn't gotten it together yet. But look at that Prairie du Chien game. Prairie du Chien is a good team. And Prairie du Chien got into the green zone once in that game and then promptly turned it over um deep you know it even with all the gaudy stats of tj pink and uh their their one two punch and receiver with davin edge and lucas ludlum and you know the interspersed running backs and all that um uh, defense is what brings the trophy home and uh i would like to see a defense that is playing as well as platteville or darlington is right now um that would be a very low scoring game i would think <laughs> Mm -hmm. I concur. I think it'd be a very low scoring game. Um, I think it'd be a very entertaining game. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably one of the most fun games of the year to be able to watch, you know, again, as a rematch, which I think both coaches are, going, are happy to say, ain't happening. <laughs> both of them are <laughs> saying that. Because yeah. I know, I'm not so sure that either one would want to have to go through that one. Uh, it's tough enough gauntlets that they go through sometimes as it is. But my compliments related to both teams and to the coaching staffs on both teams. You guys have done a heck of a job. Um, Platteville, how you came from almost disaster to all of a sudden being really, really stinking good. And Darlington for maintaining your, your, abil your ability and, and being able to keep, go keep it going. It's tough to do. In fact, I think it's tougher to keep it going once you've achieved than it is to build it. Mm -hmm. And that's saying a lot. Yeah, when you do a conference preview and it's like, okay, who's going to be in the race besides Darlington? And that's the case every single year. Uh, you know, that's a Darling. It's it's crazy to think how long Darlington has dominated the swell. I mean, it goes back into the '80s you know, when Douglas MacArthur was the coach, and then Scott Zawicki replaced him. Uh, there was another coach in between, but uh, Scott Zawicki replaced him and didn't change at all, you know, and now uh, Travis Winkers is there and Darlington still dominates this ball. Tradition. Agreed. Yep. Yeah. 
All right. So that is this week's high five as presented by Steve Prestigard. And and yeah, I think we're all pretty much in agreement. Although we kind of challenged him on it, you know, when he gave us the initial draft and stuff like that. So yeah, we all agree on it now. But yeah, that is this week's high five. And coming up on the Queen Bee Radio High School Sports Roundup, we have our one-on-one with a great one interview presented by People State Bank. We'll talk with high school official Adam Guthrie. We also have the subs.com highlight reel and the shoebox scoreboard covering the other high school sports in our area. The guys will be back in a little bit to preview the seven games that we have on Queen Bee Radio, as well as the other games involving the conferences in Southwest Wisconsin. The Queen Bee Radio High School Sports Roundup continues after this on YouTube and SoundCloud. Check out subs.com. Subs is Southwest Wisconsin's go-to supplement store. Find all your favorite supplement brands at the best prices from local people. Fuel your fitness journey. Subs.com, your go-to supplement store with locations in Fenimore and Dubuque. This week's highlight reel is presented by subs.com. Fourth and four, eighth play of the drive, their first series on homecoming night here at Lancaster High School. One receiver to the left, two to the right. And a play action fake as Wolf drops back, has a receiver wide open downfield. It's Quinton Plessel, and he is into the end zone for a flying arrows touchdown. 9.47 to go in the second quarter. Lancaster with a 14 nothing lead. And they spot the ball at the 12 yard line on the far side hash mark from where we sit. Pitch back and now a double pass forward looking for Plessel. It is caught at the 40 yard line. and gets tackled down by the waist along the Lancaster sideline on the tackle is number 16, Jordan Gager, and another Platteville first supply first down for the Flying Arrows and another big explosive play for this Flying Arrow offense. Seven fifty to go, second quarter, 14-0 Lancaster on top. Trying to go three for three on their offensive possessions here in the first half. They get inside to Alvarado. Alvarado's still on his feet, carrying defenders with him, and gets inside the goal line for Northland Buildings touchdown. I had that English social studies mind. Yeah, I was I was the uh, English major in college once upon a time, although it doesn't always come out that way on the radio. 532 to go, He's and gone. Alvarado takes off across the 40, to the 30, to the 20. Can he go in? Gets tackled down from behind. Making the saving tackles, number 14, Griffin Sprecker. But boy, Alvarado had some room when he burst through the line of scrimmage. He is in the Bytech green zone, and it will be first and goal at the five yard line. What a run by Peyton Alvarado. Out of the timeout, first and goal at the seven yard line. Yes. Wolf scrambles back, looking for someone open, and has an open receiver in the left corner. It's Logan Wolf for Northland Buildings touchdown. Let's go, both of them. Regroup, regroup here. We gotta go. Lily, good job. Come on. City sends up Alexis Rundy to serve into the back middle. Back set, left side spike, that is dug out. Set over to the left side and a spike into the corner that goes down. And into the back row to serve will be Isabella Digman and she will be the setter. Into the back middle it goes. Spike from the left side, dug out. Set by Digman. Right side spike tipped at the net and then into the back row it goes. Left side spike, big block there. And the pointers have to go all the way in the back row to get it and then send over by Gonadin. Now a quick tip at the middle by the Cubans, then saved, set, and then bumped over. Cuba City tries to set it up now. Left side spike, blocked off one of the left side, right side players from Mineral Point, but out. And a point for the Cubans, a kill for Vosburg. It's 8-4, Cuba City in set number one. As they try to take a come from behind set number one. Running jump serve, 
to the back row, dug out, set to the left side, tipped over, dug out, and then spiked on the left side by the Cubans, and they're able to send it over on a, on a bump. Monroe Point sets it up, spike into the middle, that's dug out into the net, and then can't be cleared over the net, and Monroe Point comes back to win set number one, 26, 24. This is set point. And the serve dug out, bump set, right side spike blocked the, the net, and that's it. That's Fosberg getting the block. And the final score in set number two is Cuba City 25, Mineral Point 10. We are tied at one set each, and Cabot now will serve for the two sets to one lead, Man, uh, set point. Dug out and back, set by Digman, right side flick over, but the pointers handle that. Now a left side spike by Cabot, that's dug out. Set, left side spike by Rundy, and that's doesn't clear the net, and then ends set number two, uh, three. Mineral point takes a 25-20 win in set three, and the pointers now have a two sets to one lead, serving to probably or possibly, well, hard to say about clinching because they have two matches left, but they will be in first place if they get this point. And that's set over by the Cubans. Left side spike, Ashelman, down it goes, and that's it. Final score, Mineral Point 25, Cuba City 16, and Mineral Point wins three sets to one, 26-24, 10-25, 25-20, 25-16. This one-on-one -on -one with the Great One interview is presented by People State Bank. Looking for a checking account with no monthly requirements or service charge? People's State Bank's People's Checking Account is just what you're looking for. This account includes free debit card, online and mobile banking, bill pay, and much more at no cost to you. You heard that right. No cost to you. We're your local community bank ready to serve you. People State Bank. Member FDIC. Welcome back to the Queen Bee Radio High School Sports Roundup presented by Vertical Rays Milwaukee. It's now time for us to go one-on-one -on -one with a great one presented by People State Bank. And in honor of this week being Fall Sports Officials Appreciation Week, we're going to chat with one of the best officials in our area. He will be entering his 10th year as a high school wrestling official, and he's officiated at the WIA State Wrestling Tournament. You also hear him from time to time on our uh, Queen Bee radio stations with our uh, high school wrestling coverage. Our guest this week is Adam Guthrie. Adam, thanks for joining us. How have you been doing? Doing good, Tyler. Thanks for having me on. Yep, absolutely. A pleasure to have you on. And uh, before we get into uh, the, the journey as an official, we do like to uh, talk with our guests about, you know, what their interests were um, as far as getting into sports and things like that. Uh, so let's talk about you. Uh, what sports were you into growing up and what's kept you in the high school sports scene after your playing days were done? Uh, I was active all four years throughout high school. I was a four-year football player. 
Um, I was a four year starter on the wrestling team, two year sectional qualifier. So I just, I fell in love with wrestling right away. Um, played two years of baseball. That just didn't go the way I wanted it to. So I joined track for my junior and senior year and ran track, um, sectional qualifying track in the mile. So I just was always involved and I just wanted to give back and I always wanted to stay involved. So, um, you know, I just, I got into coaching a little bit with football. I helped a little bit with track and definitely got into coaching and wrestling. And then that was what led me to the officiating end that I am into now and thoroughly enjoying very much. So. Yeah, this is going to be your 10th year as a, as a high school official. And um, I think it was something that you posted on Facebook uh, before this last year's uh, WIA State Wrestling Tournament that um, it was at that tournament that you really decided that you wanted to uh, get into the field of officiating. Uh, what was it about that tournament that led you uh, down that path? And what did you do to get that process started? Well, you know, it, I was coaching wrestling at the time and um, just coaching wasn't going the way I wanted to that year. I was struggling to get to practice every night. It was hard for me to be practice at night. And and I just like, I, I got to do something else. So I got through that year knowing that I, it's probably my last year coaching and I'm sitting here at the state wrestling tournament. And I'm like, how cool would it be to be able to be on that, that match down in front of all these people in the pole center and be able to raise the champions, the state champions hand someday in my life. And I'm like, all right, that, that's what I'm going to do. I always kind of figured it was something I would do. I'm like, that's what I want to do. I want to do it. And it was a long journey. You know, I knew it took a lot of time to get there. A lot of effort to be put in a lot of Saturdays, a lot of Thursday nights. And it was just something that I strived for and I wanted to make happen. And that goal happened last year in my ninth year. Yeah, well, that was last year of my ninth year fishing. So it was it was a lot of fun. Yeah, and, and obviously officiating the, the state tournament was one of the goals uh, that you had. But what are some of the other accomplishments and other cool moments that you've gotten to experience while be, being an official? Well, you know, and I've gotten to a lot of big games, and not just wrestling and in football, both. You know, last year I got to do the state semifinals in eight-man football between uh, DeSoto and Belmont. Very entertaining game. It was a lot mm -hmm. of fun. And football, you know, two really good teams. I think they were ranked number three and number five at the time, if I remember correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, you might know, yep. but mm -hmm. uh, really good football teams, you know, so that was something that was a lot of fun to be able to do. Um, actually, uh, this coming Friday night, I get to rep the number one ranked team in the state in division seven. I get to go up to cash and I get to see them. So, you know, that's a lot of cool things I get to do through football is get to see some of the better teams around. Um, in wrestling, some big things I've done, it's, you know, I've got to move through some tournaments. I've been to some tournaments, I've got to move up and I've got myself moved into the bi-state tournament. Um, everybody that's listening and understands wrestling knows what the bi-state tournament mm -hmm. is. You know, it's a huge tournament for Minnesota and Wisconsin. And that is a true honor to get to go there. You're not only with the best officials in the state of Wisconsin, but you're with some of the best officials in Minnesota as well. So that's a big accomplishment throughout, you know, for wrestling officiating that I've got to do as well. Yep, and you've been an official in, in three sports, football, wrestling, and you do a little bit of uh, track and field. Kind of go uh, sport by sport. What does the um, what does becoming a licensed official uh, look like uh, for, for those sports? How much time and how much energy goes into making that happen? You know, you, you can put as much time as energy as you want into it, Tyler. I'll be honest, I don't put near the time into track as I do into the wrestling. And I don't put near as much into football as I do the wrestling. Wrestling is my heart. Wrestling, that's where, that's where my love is. Um, so I put a lot of time into wrestling. I go to the clinics and I really get into the rules book really hard there. But, you know, all the wrestling is just the same. If you want to become an official, it's not really actually not that hard. You sit down and watch the same tests that the coaches take, the same um, rules video that the coaches watch. You take the same 50 question tests that the coaches that the coaches take. You get the rules book. You can. It's an open book test. You get it right in front of you. You read the questions, you go dig through the book and you find it. You you find out a lot of interesting things, no matter what sport it is, just by reading through and trying to find the answers to all 50 questions. It's actually an easy process and you can put as much time or as little time into you want, you know, as far as becoming that official. 
Awesome. And, and we hear quite a bit about, you know, the, sh the shortage of officials, you know, across pretty much all sports uh, at, at the high school level, especially around here. Uh, we see from time to time, you know, games having to be, you know, rescheduled or have adjusted start times because officials are doing multiple games on the same day uh, and things like that. Um, obviously, you and I know how important officials are to uh, keeping our, our sports going. But uh, for someone that's, you know, maybe, you know, considering it or, you know, might be on the fence about um, wanting to become an official, what are some of the things that, that you would say to someone that's, you know, you know, maybe fresh out of high school or something like that, they still want to be involved in high school sports in some way? How, do, how can officiating help um, help someone stay in that field and, and be active um, in our high school sports in our area? Most definitely, you know, um, if you want to be involved, you it's it's easy to do. Just you know, talk to any official. You know, when it comes to um, football or wrestling, I am definitely more than willing to take anybody under my wing and take them along with me to any match, any football game, and get them involved in JV and middle school stuff. Um, if you're scared of getting yelled at by the coaches, if you're scared to get yelled at your parents, it doesn't happen as much as you think. You know, every athlete sees that. You see what the officials take, what the coaches take from the parents and from the coaches. It's not that it's not as bad as everybody thinks it is. You just got to have a little bit of a thick skin. You got to let it bounce off you and got to understand that the coaches are only out there to do what's best for their athletes. They're going to they're going to yell. They're going to holler. I was in that position for 14 years. I coached 14 years in wrestling. I understand it. You know, the coaches, they just want to do what's best for their kids. So they're not mad at you. You might think they are. So. If you want something you want to get into, you're not going to get yelled at as much as you really think. You just got to let it kind of bounce off, let it roll off a little bit, kind of like water. Just let it roll off. You right. know, yeah, you're going to get yelled at. You're going to take a little bit of heat. But in the end, you're going to walk up to most of these coaches. They're going to shake your hand. and They're going to tell you how good of a job you did that night. And for the most part, I truly believe most of the coaches, when they shake your hand, that when they say you did a good job, they truly believe it. Yeah, it's really not that much different from being an athlete, really, when you think about it. It's just coaches, you know, holding, you know, officials accountable to to what they see and, and stuff like that. There, you know, there might be some back and forth. Are there any other like, you know, you know, kind of preconceived notions or, um, you know, maybe some uh, I don't want to say stereotypes, but, you know, some thoughts about officials that, you know, maybe, you know, aren't true or, you know, some. Um, some pains about being an official that um, might not be as, you know, dramatic as it seems to be? Well, you know, we always get told we're blind and we can't, you know, definitely. We can see. <laughs> so not every official is blind as much as fans want to think we are. But, um, you know, it's, I guess I can't really think of anything off the top of my head right now, Tyler, but um, it's truly rewarding to get to walk out there, whether it's football or track, you know, a couple of track meets I do a year or wrestling. It's rewarding to walk out there and get to see these athletes grow throughout a year. You know, I get to see it more in a wrestling because I see a lot of the teams over and over again to watch a kid grow from day one to the state tournament or to the you know, state tournament series. Um, I've seen different kids play football two or three games throughout the year. I'll see by the near off the year, uh, Peck, uh, not Peck, uh, Potosi Castro by their third time and watch that team grow. It's just kind of neat, you know, so it's very rewarding as a person that will watch these young athletes grow on the field. So, you know, that that's another really huge thing, how rewarding that is to be able to be a part of that. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thanks a lot for for joining us, Adam. And, and thanks again for all you do to uh, uh, help uh, do your part and help uh, keep high school sports alive, you know, with uh, all the officiating that you do uh, across uh, three sports. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for the insight. And we're looking forward to catching up with you down the line. Yeah, thank you, Tyler. Thank you for everything you guys do on the radio. You know, that's not just the athletes and everything, but what you guys do on the radio, getting everything out there is very helpful for all the communities throughout Southwest Wisconsin that you guys cover. We appreciate it as much. Yep, absolutely. We appreciate it, man. That's Adam Guthrie, a WIA licensed official. And we'll have more on the Queen Bee Radio High School Sports Roundup after this on YouTube and SoundCloud. Let's check in on the Shoebox scoreboard presented by the Shoebox in Black Earth, the largest independent shoe store in the Midwest. With the WIA seating meetings coming up on Sunday, the Mineral Point Pointers got a key win against the number 7 ranked Cuba City Cubans on Tuesday night in their only regular season matchup of the season. The Pointers are now in first place in the Swall with only two matches left in their regular season against Basquebel and Southwestern. In the SWC, Dodgeville maintained their undefeated conference record against Prairie du Chien on Tuesday night and holding their one-match lead over River Valley. 
River Valley will hope to keep pace with Dodgeville down the home stretch as they will try to take down Lancaster and Richland Center before their regular season finale against Dodgeville for a potential share of the SWC conference title. In the Six Rivers West, Highland remains undefeated in conference play as they took down second place Schallsburg three sets to two last Thursday and defeating River Ridge three sets to one on Tuesday. Highland now has a two-match lead with three matches to go, including our Tuesday night volleyball match against Belmont on 97.7 Country WGLR. In cross-country action, Platteville hosted the Platteville Invitational on Saturday. In the boys' 5,000-meter race, Dodge Point took home the large school title with 74 team points. Platteville finished 7th with 187, and the tri-up of Southwestern Cuba City and Benton finished 12th with 276 team points. In the small school division, Iowa Grant finished 2nd with 117 points, Lancaster finished 8th with 195, Schultzburg Belmont finished 12th with 248, and Darlington finished 14th with 275 points. Belleville's Carter Scholey was the top finisher by the time of 16.06, and Dodge Point's Lane Arrett, Iowa Grant's Brett Connolly, and Southwestern's Noah Wood all had top 10 finishes. In the girls' race, Dodge Point was the top large school finisher with 47 team points, Platteville finished 8th with 210, and the Southwestern Triop finished 10th with 223 points. In the small school division, Darlington finished 2nd behind New Glarus Monticello with 56 points, Lancaster finished 3rd with 75, and Iowa Grant finished 7th with 178 points. Dodge Point's Ellie Robinson was the top overall finisher with a time of 18 minutes and 33 seconds. Other top 10 finishers include Darlington's Adelie Burgett and Raquel Ryder, Southwestern's Hannah Martinson, and Dodge Point's Molly Olson. At the River Ridge Invitational on Tuesday, River Ridge finished in third place behind Kickapoo, Lafarge, and DeSoto. Brady Sheen's Samuel Kramer was the top overall finisher with a time of 1836. River Ridge's Luke Patterson finished third with a time of 1909. In the girls' race, Kickapoo Lafarge had the best overall team score with 35 points. River Ridge's Leah Patterson was the top finisher with a time of 22 minutes even. Brady Sheen's Josie Kramer, Allison Matthews, and Tana Radloff all had top 10 finishes. In girls' golf, the Lancaster Flying Arrows are returning to the WIA State Tournament after first place finishes at the Prairie du Chien Regional on September 27th and at the Trempolo Sectional on Tuesday. Both Lancaster and the Southwestern Co-op advanced to sectionals after finishing first and third respectively. Darlington Sophie Weigel and Josie Meester made it to the sectional round individually. In the sectional round, Lancaster had the best team score with 359, 12 strokes better than second place Jefferson. Brianna Kirsch tied for first place with Jefferson's Peyton Schmidt both shooting a 79 on the day. Southwestern's Riley Newhalfen and Lancaster's Linnell Miller also had top 10 individual scores on the tournament. The Flying Arrows now advance to the state tournament at University Ridge Golf Course in Madison on October 9th and October 10th. Those are the scores on the Shoebox scoreboard presented by the Shoebox in Black Earth, the largest independent shoe store in the Midwest. Grow your business by enhancing your digital marketing efforts with Queen Bee Radio and Phase 3 Digital. We provide customized solutions based on your business's unique needs, including targeted advertising, website development, and search engine optimization. Contact us at 608 349 2000 or visit p3da.com slash platteville to learn more. Back on the Queen Bee Radio High School Sports Roundup, it's now time to preview the seven games that we have across our Queen Bee Radio family of stations this coming weekend. Rejoined again by Steve Prestigard, Tom Nysis, and Wally Troughton. Uh, let's start off with what I believe is going to be the blockbuster matchup of of all the matchups that we have um, on our stations. We have River Ridge at Potosi Castle. We'll have that game on ESPN Radio, AM 1590 WPVL, also on the Queen Bee Radio Sports YouTube channel. Uh, Tom and Wally, I've been privileged to work with you two in covering the regular season matchups that these two uh, schools have had um, over the last two years. The one that Wally and I had two years ago uh, in Potosi, it was River Ridge jumped out to a 12 nothing lead. Potosi scored, I believe, 30 unanswered points before River Ridge tried to claw their way back uh, before throwing a, a game-clinching uh, interception. And then, Tom, last year, a gritty, cold-weather game, you know, smash-mouth football. 
Um, I did 27 to 13 was the final, but it took a pick six at the very end of that game for Potosi Cassville to uh, pull away. These are two programs that are rivals, but I think it's more of a, a respectful rivalry. It's not, um, you know, a, a bitter one of, of ill will, at least from, uh, from what I've seen, but um, let's, let's start off uh, with, with you, Steve, you saw Potosi Castle against Blackhawk Warren. Obviously they have a ton of momentum uh, heading into uh, this matchup with River Ridge. You also saw the Timberwolves uh, earlier uh, this season against uh, Peck Argyle. On the surface of what you know of both teams, uh, what do you kind of take away from uh, this matchup and what do you kind of think will will happen as things shake out? Well, what's going to be interesting is the matchup of Potosi Castle's defense, I think, against River Ridge's offense. Now, they faced an option offense with uh, Blackhawk Warren. It is not the same kind of offense, of course, because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, River Ridge runs a more spread-ish option uh, kind of offense, um, they kind of get involved, get the halfbacks involved a little bit less, which is kind of the hazard of having a four wide option uh, kind of offense versus in uh, Blackhawk Warren's case, where when you run the veer, you certainly get the halfback and the fullback in it a lot. And oftentimes you get the, the flanker in it as well. Um, so that's the first thought I have. And you keep in mind again, what happened in that first half, uh, in, in an incredibly hot field, by the way, which is not going to be the case Friday night. Um, but uh, Potosi Casfield just stuffed Blackhawk Ward in the first half of that game. Uh, I think River Ridge is a more uh, versatile offense. Maybe can throw the ball better uh, because I think the quarterback for Blackhawk Ward was only three for 12 in the game, though he did have a long touchdown pass. Um, this is probably one of those games where you want to make the other team one dimensional. So at least in the first half, I have to think that that matchup when River Ridge has the ball against Potosi Castle's defense will go a long way to deciding how that game's going to go. Yep. Agreed. Yep. Wally, go ahead. The thing that strikes me is that uh, I think you've learned one thing when you, when you've seen how Potosi handled Blackhawk Warren, you're not going to run the ball at him. You're not going to shove it in really when you take a look at 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 the River Ridge team, they're good inside. I mean, that's where they like would like to go. They'd really like to be able to run the ball up the middle. They're not going to do that. So what they have to do is use speed and get to the outside. And uh, how does Potosi's speed match up with them on the outside? That's what the question is going to be. Throwing the football? Ridge can, can throw the ball. They'd rather not. They really don't like to throw the ball. But again, you just you can't be certain. I mean, it's going to be very interesting. But again, it's for for Ridge to be able to put points on the board. It's going to have to be on the outside. It's not going to be straight ahead and coming up the inside because that's not where the you're running into the teeth of the dragon right at that particular point. So you're going to have to get outside and hope that the tail of the dragon isn't out there to swat you back. But I still think running into the teeth of the dragon does set up your perimeter runs. Exactly. And so I think Mm -hmm. you have to to probe. You have to do it um, and make them shut you down. But that's kind of the, you know, that inside run is is River Ridge's bread and butter. You know, I I think the Potosi-Blackhawk game, I didn't see it. Steve called it. We've talked about this before. The higher you go up the ladder in terms of playing good teams, you've got to be diversified. You know, if you're a football, if you're a football team that wants to beat a good opponent, I think you have to both run and pass. And if you are, can only do one thing, a good team is going to shut you down. So I don't know. Um, I think if I'm Ridge, I try that inside run. Uh, they have plenty of opportunities to work the perimeter. Their quarterbacks can throw. I think they have to mix it up to keep the Potosi defense off balance. I know Potosi's offense will do that to the River Ridge defense. They can do both. I went back and looked at their last four games, all won by Potosi. But when you average the scores, it comes out to less than seven points difference over those four meetings. Mm -hmm. Included in that was a playoff game that was 15 to 14 Potosi. 
and it was 14 to nothing River Ridge going into the fourth quarter. I think it's going to be a tight game. I think it's going to be a tough game. You guys were mentioning ahead of time, Potosi maybe is dealing with injuries, but they have a lot of kids. You know, I think they have pretty good depth. And, um, you know, if you play the uh, let's go corresponding scores, River Ridge had a Dickens of a time against um, Blackhawk Warren. Potosi handled them. But I think you can throw that out when these two teams get together. I think it's going to be a good football game and whoever's calling it is going to have a lot of fun. One of the things I think is just kind of the other point with this, you're looking at two coaches that know each other very well. Yep. They're friends. I mean, they, during off season, they talk about different things and all of that. Um, so you have that in there as well. And as a result, when a game comes together, how do the kids respond and how do they play? And it'll be all about the players on the two teams. Um, it'll be interesting. It'll be a fun game. I'm looking forward to covering that one with uh, Josh Wiederholt. And I think it, this kind of ties into a conversation that we had about the Darlington Cuba City game where these kids are playing against each other in multiple sports. They know mm -hmm. each other. They know their strengths. They know their weaknesses where, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter how well you played in a previous game or, you know, a, a comparable team. If you know your opponent's, you know, strengths and weaknesses, this ends up being a much more, you know, competitive game and, you know, some of these kids, you know, who knows around here, you know, they might be, you know, cousins or if, you know, played, you know, travel ball as, you know, teammates in, in other sports. I mean, you don't necessarily know what the dynamic is, you know, going to be from game to game when you have these, you know, closer geographic matchups. But all I know is this, anytime it's a game involving River Ridge and Potosi or a River Ridge and Potosi Cassville co-op, it's, it's can't miss. It is a grinded out physical game regardless of what uh what sport it is i think it's uh going to be an entertaining game and and very curious to see how that shakes out because a river ridge win does force a three-way tie for the conference heading into you know the final week of the season not necessarily in terms of the wia that count the the small crossover games as conference matchups but to decide the six rivers conference among the six rivers teams you already you already saw Potosi Castle beat Blackhawk Warren. Blackhawk Warren beat River Ridge. So a River Ridge over Potosi would force a three-way tie heading into the final week of the season where um, I believe Potosi Castle goes to uh, Southwestern East Dubuque to close out the season, which that is not going to be an easy game or, you know, a, a walkthrough by, by any stretch. That's going to be a, a tough way for um potosi castle to have to try and close out a a conference title if they were to fall to river ridge so i think that's going to make for a very intriguing uh outcome on friday night looking forward to that one again that'll be on espn radio am 1590 wpvl and the queen bee radio sports youtube channel the three other games that we have on queen bee radio let's start off with platteville at Poinette on extreme 1071 uh steve you and tom will be uh covering that one uh, Tom, I know you've probably been in the lab kind of studying up on uh, Poinette. Uh, what are some of the things that uh, that stand out about uh, Poinette heading into this matchup with Platteville? Well, they have a, you know, a quarterback who uh, works out of the shotgun. His name is Meister. They do have a decent running back in the backfield, Hathaway. Um, I'm going to ask you guys, I don't know how Wally did this, their coaches signal in the plays from the sideline. Mm -hmm. I mean, in baseball, you they're always intercepting, you know, steal signs and things like that. I was wondering if you could, you know, steal their signs, you know, from the opposite sideline. I mean, I, I consider that to be a little bit of a risky thing to do. Um, here's, to me, is the big deal. Platteville is averaging 30 points, over 30 points on offense. Their defense is around 12, a differential of over 18 points per game. Poinette, they're only averaging eight points on offense per game. They're giving up over 26. They have a differential of a negative 18 points per game. In five games, they've scored seven points or less. And in their win against Westfield last week, it was a pick six. That's the only touchdown that they scored. Uh, I think 
Platteville, the only way, to me, the only way this game is close is if Platteville does not come into the game with the uh, proper mental attitude and allows um, Poinette to hang around. I just think Platteville's a better team, and I think they will prove it on uh, on Friday. I think Platteville's quarterback play will be huge. You know that I am, of course, a fan of weird trivia. And <laughs> so here is the no. – there's actually two There's actually two pieces of weird trivia tied to this game. Um, the first is that this is actually going to be the last time that an SWC team plays a South Central team as a crossover game, and that's for two reasons. Number one, um, there was a program where they came up with this uh, conference schedule, Montello, Princeton, Green Lake. Well, they do not exist anymore. They are now two eight-man teams, Montello, then Princeton, Green Lake. WI never got around to putting somebody else in their place. So next week, Prairie Duchene gets a forfeit win over the former Montello, Princeton, Green Lake. Uh, so that is uh, this game Friday night. It's going to be the last time that those two uh, conferences play in the crossover game, and it's been a crossover that has that the SWC has absolutely dominated. I think uh, that the only SWC team to have lost to a uh, South Central team this year was River Valley. They got beat by Wisconsin Dells, who happens to be tied for first. The even weirder stat is that Platteville has a 17 game winning streak against teams with black and orange color. <laughs> Steve, that, that bit not. of trivia makes me worry about you. I worry <laughs> about you an awful lot. Join me the crowd. too. <laughs> I'm that, I've been thinking did, about him a long time for things like that. Yeah, well, Wally and I actually did the last game that Platinum lost to a black and orange team. It was Black River yeah. Falls. Uh, back when they had the, the third and fourth week games against teams from um, the Cooley. the uh, Cooley Conference, yeah. That was, by the way, where I had one of the greatest pregame meals ever, which was the pork dog uh, up at Black River Falls. It was a hot yep. dog with uh, pulled pork on top and barbecue sauce. It was fantastic. But uh, <laughs> that's a long way, River uh, Black River Falls. Is. But, yeah, so uh, if you look, you know, they played Barocco a couple times, beat them. They have a decade-long win streak against Dodgeville, and then they have a longer win streak than that against Richland Center. So, you know, if they um, if they played Barocco again, bet on Platteville, and um, I'm trying to think of somebody else who's black and orange that might be in Platteville's level. If there's any team in the postseason that they might see or something there like that. There might be one. Might be. <laughs> well, that's an important statistic, and we should stay aware of that. <laughs> You, you, you know, th there's, there's, you know, next gen stats, and then there's that. You know, that yeah. is, you know, the the top level. Like we're breaking it down by team color, you know, and you know, I and you know, is there something to it? Is there something that you can tie to it, Steve, that would indicate why Platteville is successful against teams that wear black and orange? Well, maybe we should ask Cuba City Family Dental since they sponsor the colors of the game. <laughs> um, but, uh, I, you know, it's got to be just that Richland Center hasn't been good in a long time and Dodgeville hasn't been good in a long time. And, uh, you know, in, in Roqua too, yeah. In the seasons where um, the SWC played the Cooley Conference, the SWC just hammered them. And the only, the only Cooley teams that won were typically whoever won the conference. And Blackhawk, or, uh, Black River Falls – did win the conference back-to-back -back seasons uh, about uh, seven or eight years ago, and that happened to be who Platteville played. Um, I cannot imagine what else, you know, what other explanation there would be. I have to agree with you. But getting back to point at, the only way that I'm worried about this game is the fact that if the Platteville players are looking to just right on past, looking at what's going to come on a little bit in the future, which I don't expect, and as a result, it could be a trap game. And you always have to watch out for them. These are the kinds of teams you play when all of a sudden if you find that it turns around and it bites you in a bad spot. So it's a matter of well, playing. That was kind of, yeah, and that was sort of how the Richland Center game started because Rich, uh, Platteville did uh, falter on a couple of series in the first half. Um, but uh, And it was only 10 nothing until the last minute of the first half, and all of a sudden – Platteville got a score, 
uh, one, another one of their patented late first half uh, races to the end zone. Um, and then all of a sudden they poured it on the second half. The defense for Richmond Center, which is a very young defense, uh, just kind of got overwhelmed, basically. They stayed in it well in the first half and then kind of faded after that. Maybe you could see that with, you know, with this kind of game Friday night. Um, but Flatville seems pretty locked in to me from what I've been able to observe. Yeah, that's Platteville at Point Net. We'll have that game on Friday night on Extreme 1071 and X1071.com. Our next game, Lancaster at Dodgeville on 977 Country WGLR. And uh, Tom, you and I have both seen uh, Lancaster and Dodgeville. And I think the key for Lancaster in this one play well, stay healthy. Don't look ahead to Broadhead Judah just yet. You know that they're they're coming up, but get out of there as healthy as you can. And make sure that your mind is right heading into that regular season finale. Just do your arrow raid. Let your offensive line <laughs> go out and dominate. Uh, continue to play good defense, and you know they just should be able to physically go go there and uh, you know take care of that game on both sides of the football. You know, you know we've we've seen we've seen Dodgeville, we've seen Lancaster a lot. Uh, Lancaster just, I think, is similar to Platteville. You need to get off the bus in those first couple of series. Don't shoot yourself in the foot. Run your offense. Be precise. And uh, just slowly kind of crush the will out of them, I think. You know, high school coach, uh, back when I was in, in high school in Harmony, Minnesota, again, this is one that he would say, you're supposed to win. And doggone it, go win. Go have fun. Play the game hard and have fun. And the other thing is the rule of avoiding an upset is don't let the other team think they're in the game. You know, right. the longer the game goes on and the longer it's closer, you start to think, uh-oh, we might not win this after all. So, you know, it, if you if you can take them out of it by the half or earlier than the half, if you got running time before the end of the half, so be it and good for them. Yeah, Blancaster at Dodgeville Friday night on 97.7 Country, WGLR and WGLR.com. The final game we have on Friday night, Cuba City at Fenimore. We'll have that one on Super Hits 106 and Super Hits 106.com. Uh, Wally, the, the key for this one, I think, you know, looking at uh, both Cuba City and Fenimore, Cuba City, the win gets them into uh, the the playoffs. So a, a key thing for them to play well and uh, Fenimore, probably rested because they did have the uh, forfeit to Parkview Albany last week. They're looking to um, uh, hit someone besides themselves. They haven't been able to hit someone besides themselves over the last two weeks, but um, somewhat similar to Lancaster and Dodgeville. I think it's just play well, stay healthy, do what you need to do, take care of business and get the win. This has been a year where, you know, for Fenimore at the beginning of the year, things were looking good. They thought, you know, before coming into it, they were looking at having a, they were looking at this could be a pretty good year. And if something could go wrong, it did right at the beginning. So that's the unfortunate thing, but that's over now. It's time to move on. And I'd like to think that the players have improved significantly as we've moved along. Um, Rosemary coach teams usually respond fairly well and, and do quite well. Um, this could be a rebuilding year for them at the at this particular point, but this would be a big game for them to look and uh, look well and to play well and to all of a sudden say, "Look, kids, this is where we've come. We've improved up to this particular point." But on the other side of it, it's a guy cop coach team. Guys, more or less, telling the players, "No, we're going out after them. We're going to win this game, and we're going to do it in going away." Let's go out and let's just be physical, play hard, and have fun. And that's a game Cuba City needs to have because uh, I don't know that they want to go into the last week of the season having to win that game uh, to clinch mm -hmm. the playoff. Now, right. they're on the bubble right now, um, but, you know, that's a tough team to wrap your season up against, Mineral Point. Uh, so from the Cuba's perspective, you got to take care of business this week. They don't mm -hmm. have to worry about that next week. Yep, agreed. Cuba City at Fenimore will have that game Friday night on Super Hits 106 and superhits106.com. 
three games on Saturday. We'll start off with the one that uh, you have, uh, Steve, on Saturday. Hillsboro at Highland, the battle for first place in the Ridge and Valley. That'll be on ESPN Radio, AM 1590, WPVL. Again, Ridge and Valley, we don't really know what to expect. It's just going to be a fun football game. It's going to be Highland's homecoming. It's going to be an awesome environment. I know you're looking forward to it. What are the things that you're looking for on the football field, if you can put something together on that? Well, and that's an, part of the difficulty with this game, other than the fact that, well, it's the Ridge and Valley, therefore, you know, conventional rules do not apply. Um, but nobody knows a whole lot about Highland because Highland doesn't play teams in this area. They're in a different conference for all their other sports. People know about Highland. You know, you can watch them play baseball or basketball and know who, who the athletes are. But that's not necessarily the case about, you know, with Hillsborough. So that's part of what makes this game a little bit of a mystery to how Hillsborough has played this season. Um, but, you know, it's, it's every time you think you know what's going to happen, things happen. And, you know, that's not how it happens. I think that Highland was somewhat predicted to be where they were, although, you know, Ithaca, I think, was uh, picked the most often uh, to win. Somebody said that, that Ithaca was the odds-on favorite to win the Ridge Valley. That would be right there. there. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I, agree. I mean, you know, you hear, you've heard about the curse of being number one or whatever. It kind of feels like the team in first place in the Ridge Valley is the team that probably loses the next week, which indeed did happen this last week. So, well, wait um, a minute here. What did you know? What a difference a year makes. How did Hillsborough do a year ago? They struggled. Mm -hmm. I mean, the majors struggled, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden they're fighting to win the conference championship. Welcome to the Ridge and Valley, because <laughs> the unusual is going to pop up and get you. And look at where they are now. The big thing that Highland has going for it is one of the things that they're traditionally known for. I don't care if we're the smallest team playing 11 man football or whatever it is in the state, or because they have been in the past. They were always one of the most physical for the size of the school. Mm -hmm. And if they, and they got that from the Six Rivers Conference when they were in the Six exactly. Rivers, because that's how everybody plays in the Six Rivers. Uh, yeah, so um, I think that that intangible of being the last conference champion in the Ridge and Valley is going to be a big motivator for both of these teams. This is Highland's last 11-player homecoming. Um, you know, going out like that, I think, is a is a huge um, huge motivator for the Cardinals, at least. And, you know, again, to be the last Ridge and Valley champ is a big motivator, I'm sure, for Hillsborough also. So, um, you know... Maybe Highland will go to Platteville and try to borrow some of that anti-black and orange mojo for that game. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I'll say this about Highland and, and Hillsboro. I had that homecoming matchup two years ago when Highland was one of the top-ranked teams in the state. I believe they were number two um, at that point in Division Seven, and they beat the brakes off Hillsboro. I think it was like 65 to two. And I remember that the safety came because the backup punter had the snap go over his head and go back into the end zone. Like it was a, a very dominant one. And um, I believe Hillsboro, um, there was a COVID situation where they didn't play for two weeks. So their first game coming out of that uh, was against uh, Highland. It was just not a, a very good matchup. So to see Hillsboro come back and, and be a conference contender is, is a really cool thing. And um, I think uh, looking to avenge some of that uh, might be um, a motivating factor for that. Should be a fun one. Yeah. Uh, Steve, have some fun with that one on Saturday on ESPN Radio AM 1590 WPBL. The only negative I have for Highland for this football game, it's homecoming. I've never liked homecoming. When homecoming <laughs> is at your school, more crazy things go on during the week and where is the focus on all the crazy things that are happening difficult for the kids to be focused on what needs to be done if they can be there then they're going to be fine well now this this makes here's my comparison Ridge valley conference is like seven weeks of homecoming games <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay. Valid point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well taken. 
<laughs> yeah, we have another Ridge and Valley game on Saturday as well on Extreme 1071, Iowa Grant at Ithaca. And again, uh, we mentioned this during the, the recap okay. session. Uh, you know, these two teams sitting at two and three uh, conference records. So two wins, you know, guarantees them, uh, you know, a spot in the playoff. And I'm very curious to see what that dynamic uh, is going to look like. Ithaca did have a coaching change a couple weeks ago. Uh, Steve Olson is out and now there is a dual uh, head coaching uh, dynamic. It's David Kling and Kyle Kelly. They are co-head coaches uh, for at least the remainder of this season. Um, you know, we saw that. Uh, with uh, River Valley, that's something that they uh, continue having. So I'm curious to see how that uh, dynamic plays out. But, you know, uh, we know about Iowa Grant. Uh, we saw them against uh, basketball. Tom and I did. And um, th there's some very good athletes on that uh, Iowa Grant team. Kyle Steffel was uh, great at the quarterback position. Mm -hmm. And uh, last week we mentioned that he was not at the quarterback position um, last week. But Coach... Uh, uh, the coach for Iowa Grant said that uh, Kyle Steffel will be at the quarterback position again this week. So I don't know, um, you know, what the dynamic was that caused the change initially, but it seems like he'll be back at the QB position and should be uh, a very intriguing matchup. Looking forward to calling that one uh, with Brad Richardson on Saturday afternoon. Again, Iowa Grant and Ithaca on Extreme 1071 and X1071.com. We also have... A Six Rivers matchup on Saturday afternoon. Southwestern East Dubuque at Peck Argyle. We'll have that one on Super Hits 106 and SuperHits106.com. And uh, Wally, we've been talking about this with uh, Southwestern East Dubuque for for quite a bit. I refer to them as a scrappy football team because they just they don't necessarily win a lot of games, but they're competitive in almost every game uh, mm -hmm. you know that they're in. Uh, you had had said that they are going to be a thorn in the side of everyone that they play, and they certainly seem to have been that for uh, for a majority of the season, but they head into um, uh, Peck Argyle. I believe it's the second homecoming game for uh, Peck Argyle coming up uh, this weekend. Uh, but uh, what do you uh, make of that uh, matchup on Saturday? Well, I'm glad to say for Peck Argyle's sake that as the year's gone on, they've improved, but they've gained some new players that have come out that have gotten involved and, and that's helped them. Um, I don't know if it's helped them enough to be able to pull that thorn out of their side, so to speak. Um, that's going to have to be seen. Um, Southwest Unite East Dubuque is, you know, I hate to say it, you know, that a team deserves a win along the line, but the way their season has gone, and they've earned another win somewhere along the line here. Well, there's not many more games along the line, and this might be their best chance. Well, Southwestern East Dubuque has given everybody that they played fits. They haven't won very much, but um, they have made games much more difficult than it looked like they were going to be. So, um, you know, it's not going to be reflected in their record this year, but obviously something is going right in that program that they are uh, as competitive as they are against teams that are better than they are. I hope that somewhere along the line that the – even though there's no asterisk on your record, I hope that somewhere along the line, the kids understand we're a lot better than we give ourselves credit for. We can do this and maybe next year they'll become even better. Yeah, but like I mentioned at the beginning of the season, Southwestern East Dubuque does not have a playoff to qualify for. They're ineligible because of the, the co-op, their mm -hmm. uh, two year uh, probation on that. But as I said, all of their games this year are essentially playoff games because it's do what you can to uh, make an impact on the conference. And they have not been an easy out for uh, any team that they've uh, played so far this season uh, should be a fun uh, matchup. We have on Saturday on super hits, one Oh six and super hits, one Oh six.com uh, real quickly. We'll go through some of the other games uh, in our area um, in the SWC big matchup Prairie to Sheen at Broadhead Judah. I'm sure the Lancaster flying arrows have some vested interest in that. Cause that determines what's what their fate will be uh, in the final uh, week of the season. And then uh, Richland center at uh, river Valley uh, Tom looking at uh, Prairie to Sheen and uh, Broadhead Judah. You've um, you know, you've seen Prairie to Sheen twice. Uh, Steve, you've seen uh, Broadhead Judah against Platteville. Um, 
I, I, I'm very curious to see how this one shakes out because I think for Prairie du Chien, this is probably much more of a must win for them. And I think for the Flying Arrows, I think they're rooting for Prairie du Chien because that takes some of the pressure off when they play Broadhead Judah uh, in the final week of the season. Uh, Tom, I'll start with you and then Steve, you can chime in. Well, you know, I think Prairie needs to continue to improve at the quarterback position. That's kind of one of their weaknesses. I think they got to get the ball into Blake Theory's hands. Mm -hmm. You know, when they get the ball into Blake Theory's yeah. hands, good things happen. And they have other running backs as well. But that'll be a great challenge for the Hawks on the road. Um, Steve Seen, Broadhead Judah, I'm not sure what their quarterback play is like. But, um, you know, Prairie has a dynamic running game. But it, it, I just contend the further you go up the ladder, you better have some balance. And, Prairie has not had enough passing yards, I think, to be able to get by some of the top teams that they faced in the schedule. Yeah, and, and you know, this is a – it's two very run-heavy teams, but in different senses. Of course, uh, Broadhead Judah is a wing T team. Gabe Bacup, their quarterback, uh, he certainly played, I thought, quite well, uh, other than the two interceptions against uh, – against Platteville when we saw them. Um, and then, of course, you have Prairie du Chien as an I-formation team. So um, if you were thinking, you know, I, I guess a prediction would be a pretty low-scoring game, I would think, uh, between these two teams. And whoever can run the ball most effectively against a team that knows what it's going to get, um, you know, I tend to think is uh, that's going to end up deciding. If there's an intangible, it's that, Prairie du Chien, I don't think a lot of people picked them to beat Broadhead Judah last year, but they did. And I'm sure Broadhead Judah remembers that. And Jim Matthias, if the players don't, he will tell them that this week if he hasn't already. <laughs> I think um, they beat him as, twice last year. Oh, uh, that's right. Yeah, in the playoffs mm -hmm. also. Yep. I'm positive that will come up. And then as far as Richland Center and River Valley goes, that's an elimination game for the playoffs. Um, last year, you remember River Valley – Started off 0-6, didn't look like anything was going to happen, and then all of a sudden they beat Lancaster, and then they beat Richland Center, and then they beat Platteville, and, you know, three must-win games, and they won them all and got into the playoffs. Um, Richland Center, you know, they've got some athletes, but they would have to play a whole lot better against Valley than they did against Platteville in order to win that game. I agree. Let's move into the Swall, the two other – uh, matchups, uh, Darlington at Belleville and Parkview Albany at Mineral Point. I think that those are probably going to be decisive wins um, for uh, both uh, Darlington and Mineral Point. Um, I have not heard anything about um, Parkview Albany. If th it seems like that that game uh, that that game will be played. And uh, for uh, Darlington at Belleville, I think it's uh, kind of similar to what we've been talking about with some of these other, you know, lopsided matchups. It's just Go in, play your game, come out healthy, keep yep. that momentum going. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> All right, the other matchup in the Six Rivers Conference: Benton Scales Mount Shellsburg at Blackhawk Warren. Blackhawk Warren trying to get back on the uh, winning track. And uh, Wally, you've seen uh, you saw Benton Scales Mount Shellsburg earlier in the season against uh, uh, Cuba City. Uh, we kind of know about them. The numbers have not been, you know, the you know the greatest for for the tryout, but. Um, you know, they're led into a, a game against Blackhawk Warren that's, you know, looking to get things on the right track after a tough loss to Potosi Cassville. I don't think they're up to it. I really don't. I, I, you know, I'm, I've, I've always have had a place in my heart for the Benton Scales Mound co-op, and then I've always had a place in my heart for Schultzburg. But uh, I'm sorry, guys. I'm not so certain that you have the horsepower to be able to um, – Take it to Blackhawk Warren. I, I I really don't think you do, um, but you know stranger things have happened. They they really have. And the the thing that we don't always look at is the fact that it's how does this team match up with that team as much as it is how is what's the record? You know how does this team match up with that? Uh, is it how does their defensive line match to their offensive line or all those different things? And you saw the matchup thing with Platteville and Lancaster. 
where Platteville struggled with the offensive line for Lancaster, but Lancaster struggled with the speed of Platteville. God, that, what a shock that is because it used to be the speed of Lancaster. But it's it's mm -hmm. one of those things. It's just how does the matchup occur? I still favor um, Blackhawk Warren as far as being the winner in the game, but I'm disappointed that uh, the, the Knights, and I still have trouble with the Knights calling them that. <laughs> um, but I... I I I hope they play well and show up well. One thing to keep to keep in mind about Blackhawk Warren, and I don't know, I don't think this is going to have an impact Friday night, but Blackhawk Warren's eleven offensive starters are also their defensive starters. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Now they did get one of their players back uh, for last week, uh, but this is not a team that has a huge amount of depth. Now, obviously, hardly anybody does in in Division Seven. But um, that's got to be one Blackhawk Warren goal. They only have one loss this year. They're going to get a high playoff seed. But they have to make sure that they get through this last game or this yeah. game and then their last game and not get somebody hurt because that wipes people, you know, that, that takes away an offensive starter and a defensive starter and probably somebody who plays on special teams, uh, you know, both sides of the ball also. So that, that's got to be a concern for Blackhawk Warren in this game. We're at a point right now where I think what one of the things you, we're starting to hint at a little bit is we're already starting to look and talking about playoffs. And we're already talking about having players ready, having, you know, not losing players, that kind of a thing, and matchups and so on. Um, this is where it becomes a point of concern for coaches uh, as much as us, you know, speculating. But where you're looking at, what, how are these matchups going to occur? What is it we have to be aware of as we're looking ahead? Um, because they're doing that too, and trying to make certain that they have players prepared for what's going to come ahead. One of the things we talk about is the idea of being a balanced offense. I agree. I'm all for a balanced offense. But if you think about it, think of all the championship games you've seen at Camp Randall. How many are passing teams? Not very many. Right. Those are running teams. And why are they running teams? It's called November. Because it's exactly. miserable. And as a result, you have to be able to run the football. Yes, passing will has got to be there, and you've got to be able to mix it in. But you need to be able to run the ball. And somewhere along the line, if you haven't done that well during the season, now as you're finishing up this year, you need to be able to find something, some way that you feel like you can run the ball. And then, as, as you, assuming you are a playoff team, then being able to move that along as you're moving in, you know, through the playoffs and being able to run the ball more effectively, you have to be able to do that if you want to come home with a gold football. And one thing that is an interesting back of the mind question for a coach, I have to think, is. You look at River Ridge and Potosi Cassville. This is their not necessarily only time that they are going to play each other. And Correct. it's entirely possible that in a couple of weeks they'll turn around and play each other again. And I don't know, you know, it, it's an interesting question to ask. Do you throw some stuff in to, that you don't necessarily think you're going to use but make them to prepare for for a possible next matchup? Or do you just play very vanilla, beat them with the stuff that you've been doing all year, and then you know save some stuff for the next matchup? I mean, it's hard to say if there, there is going to be a next matchup, but no one would be surprised, certainly, if, as an example, River Ridge and Potosi Castle played in the playoffs again, uh, or you know the Ridge and Valley teams faced off for the second time, because uh, they're all Division Seven schools, also. Um, you know, that's that'd be interesting to ask a coach that you know when you're going into these late season games against teams that you may very well end up facing again uh, in a couple of weeks in the postseason. I think one of the things that, that you're alluding to there is the fact that while you have some plays that you have practiced, you've gone over and you've done, but they're back on page eight, you know, of, of your playbook. They're not on page one or two. And yeah, you've gone through them and that type of thing, but you really don't want to bring them out. You really don't. You, 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 that's something that even though you've done it in practice and, and maybe you snuck it in a game somewhere along the line, but you don't want to pull it out here if you don't have to. You really don't. 
Not a and I think that, that that's the same thing on defense. You know, yes. you may have a special blitz package. You may have something that's special for your defense. Hey, save it until the playoffs. It's a more important game, some might say. Exactly. Sa save, save it for when you need it, not when you want mm -hmm. to. You, you don't want to be playing mind games with other coaches, I don't think. I think it's more just concentrate on your brand. Do what you know your team is going to be successful at. Put them in the best spot to be successful. I don't think you necessarily want to get into that, you know, trying to put stuff in there just for the sake of putting it in there and having coaches spend time preparing for it. I think play to your strengths, do what you got to do, and play your brand of football. Exactly. You have to know who you are and then play the game as based on who you are. Now, if you've got something that's not who you are that you could throw in there once in, somewhere along the line, well, that's a different thing. But you got to know who you are and play for who you are. And this is the point of the season where when you're playing, and I'll just use this as an example, well, you know, Lank, uh, Platteville's going to be favored in their last two games. Um, Barry Alvarez, when he started at Wisconsin, I think was the first coach I ever heard use the phrase, play against the game. Yeah, yes. for, In yep. the first couple of years, we're not very good. They went into games they know they were going to get beat. So their evaluation of how they did wasn't based on the final score necessarily, but did they do the things they wanted to do? And did they do them in the manner that they wanted to do? Well, that could really apply to, you know, teams that have relatively easy opponents in the last couple of weeks. You know, okay, we can probably play poorly and still beat this team, but that's really not going to get it done in the postseason because you'll be playing progressively better teams. Therefore, these are the things we want to do, and this is what we're going to evaluate ourselves on. Did we get certain number of yards on first down? Was our pass completion percentage at least this much? Did we win the turnover battle? Um, did we avoid doing dumb things, you know, uh, penalties and that sort of thing? And I have to think that that's what coaches, when they have easy schedules late in the season, when they know they're going into the playoffs, that, that they start evaluating themselves based on that, not necessarily, okay, we beat this team because they're not very good. Um, but, you know, to be able to, know your team what you need to do and then evaluate did you do that or not even if you won the game uh i think we're going to be seeing that in the next couple of weeks also i think yep. uh, one of the things you're referring to there too that alvarez did and i i'm sorry for mentioning this name because some people will say why do you talk about somebody like that bobby knight bobby knight when he was in <laughs> indiana in particular he had that same type of a thing where it was a matter of it's how did Indiana do against Indiana? How did Indiana do against Indiana? Based on those variety of things, based on making free throws, based on out of bounds plays, based on every little basketball thing you can think about, he had all of these things that he had and they expected to be able to do it at that level or at the level he believed is where Indiana should be. That was his philosophy that he used in those particular points. And that's pretty much what Barry Alvarez was focusing on there as well. That same type of thing. You have to go out and play yourself or beat yourself or not beat yourself by doing the right things. Hmm. Yep. That's a very long, exhaustive look at Benton Scales, Mount Schellsberg at Blackhawk Warren. That'll be uh, coming up uh, later on this week. Uh, let's uh, move into uh, the other matchups in the Ridge and Valley. Uh, Basquebel at New Lisbon. Basquebel looking for their first win of the season. They travel to New Lisbon, who is five and 5-2 in Go the Bulldog. Cedar Bluffs Conference. And then uh, Riverdale at uh, Seneca Wazika Steuben, where, again, I think for the Blue Golds, it's you know, you're in that second place spot now in the in the Ridge and Valley. Try to maintain that pace and and hold off uh, Riverdale and, you know, see how things uh, kind of shake out, you know, the, the rest of the way in the, the Ridge and Valley. Yeah, pretty much it. It's it's going to be an interesting thing in the and uh, how do things look from the Ridge? They look sunny. <laughs> kind of be positive for Ridge and Valley here. <laughs> yep. Indeed. All right, let's move into eight-player footballs. Two very interesting matchups in the Ridge Valley eight-player conference. Wisconsin Heights at Belmont. Uh, those teams are both two and one. And then North Crawford at DeSoto, where, you know, as we were mentioning in the recap, where 
DeSoto's been up and down. They're unpredictable. We don't know which team is going to show up, but if the really good DeSoto team shows up, that makes for a very fun matchup against North Crawford. And I think, again, Belmont is probably uh, rooting for DeSoto to a certain extent to try and make it a, a tie where Belmont has a say in how uh, the conference goes the rest of the way. The third matchup, Wanawak Center, Weston at uh, Kickapoo. Uh, but uh, Wally, I think, you know, Wisconsin Heights at Belmont and North Crawford at DeSoto, those two matchups this week really determines the way the conference is going to shake out. Oh, totally. I mean, we're looking at a point, you know, the the, uh, the Belmont-Wisconsin Heights game, I think, is going to be a very interesting game. And we can look at that right from this side. We already know that's going to be a good ball game. We just already know that. Just because of how the teams play and how they how they've done the DeSoto North Crawford, it's all a matter of who shows up for DeSoto. Is it the DeSoto team that wins and is a the thorn in the side of everyone, or is it the DeSoto team that is waiting for somebody to show up on the field and oh, I guess we're supposed to be down there and play too. It's that's all depending on that. Um, the other game doesn't mean a whole lot except to the people that are playing it. There is one thing to say about the North Crawford DeSoto game, and that is that that game is in DeSoto, which means it's at the oh, yeah. pit. Uh, and uh, DeSoto is a very different team historically at home than they are on the road. You know, sometimes home field advantage is kind of overrated, but I don't think it is with DeSoto because anybody who has seen that field um, knows that that is a big challenge for any team that goes in there. And I got to do a game once sitting outside um, as the fog was rolling in because there was a Saturday night game and and there was, uh, you know, there have been deer that ran onto the field during the game, forces, you know, forced the game to end to uh, be delayed and all that. Um, that is, that's one of the, everybody should go to at least one game at the pit because, it is truly the most unique place there is anymore to play uh, in Southwest Wisconsin. And the fact that North Crawford has to go to DeSoto for that game, I think gives a DeSoto an advantage in that game. Years ago, there was a coach up there by the name of Gene Schultz. And Gene Schultz won a lot of football games. And one of the things that he did, particularly if you ne had never been there before as a team, you're out there and you're getting ready for the game, warming up, you know, and all of that kind of a thing. And all of a sudden you start looking around, where's the DeSoto team? They're nowhere to be seen. They don't even have their water jugs and stuff down on the side of the field. I mean, no one's around. And then all of a sudden you hear the screaming as the players come down the hill, down into the pit, and all of a sudden, they're bringing water jugs and all the stuff they have on their sideline. <clears throat> they ended up, and they did all their warming up up in the building. They did all their loosening up up there. And then they came down with all of that and right back out on the field for the coin toss. And it was crazy. I mean, you talk about a way to demoralize whoever is playing because you're spending most of your time worried about them instead of worrying about you. And that was crazy. That's called Welcome to DeSoto. Those uh, tactics didn't work quite so well when he took his act up to the Fox Valley. It was a very much a different game <laughs> up there when he went to Menasha. He did yeah. not have a lot of success uh, up there. So those mind games did not work so well when you're playing <laughs> Kimberly, Kakana, Nina, and everybody else in that league. That's true. <laughs> But it worked pretty good in DeSoto. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Hey, hey. And I'll tell you what, they had the greatest fundraisers on earth back in those days because everybody was donating everything and they had all kinds of money for their football program. So that wraps up the uh, preview for this coming week. Uh, before we close up shop, we'll uh, kind of go around and, uh, you know, maybe a, one or two things uh, that, that you're looking for um, heading into this week. I think for me, the the there's kind of two things you know one in particular the ridge and valley what is going to happen this week what does that picture look like <laughs> uh heading into uh the final week of the season and in particular the teams that are on the bubble the iowa grants the ithacas you know how are they you know this is going to be a 
a test of character, which which teams are going to do what they need to do to uh, to take care of business. And then um, just, you know, kind of a, a sub side to that. The teams that are, you know, what we'll say, you know, favored against lesser competition. How are they going to look in this, you know, final, you know, final stretch, you know, as they prep for some bigger matchups uh, down the line, whether it's, you know, conference title implications in the final week of the season or getting prepped uh, for a postseason run. A number of the teams that are at the top that we've covered are already, you know, in the playoffs. It's more about seeding and getting prepared uh, for the postseason. Um, I'll turn it over to uh, Steve. What are you looking for uh, heading into this week? Well, I'm going to resolve that and make the resolution that I will not be surprised by anything that happens Friday and Saturday in the Rich Valley Conference. Um, I'm happy that I, I didn't even think of this, but when, you know, Wally mentioned his love of homecoming games, it just occurred to me that that's what the Rich and Valley is this season. It's been seven weeks of homecoming games for everybody, and therefore, you know, literally that unpredictable. So that game Saturday, you know, the game we're doing, Hillsborough Highland Saturday, I'm just going to not be surprised at anything because I assume any weird thing in any of those games uh, could happen. You could see a blizzard out of nowhere Saturday afternoon or something like that. Um, so th that is my resolution for the week, to just not be surprised at anything that happens in the Ridge and Valley Friday or Saturday. Just remember one thing, and that is there will not be any snow or any of those kinds of things the sun is going to be shining on the Ridge and Valley. <laughs> yeah, they exactly. would come up with our name, highs and lows for the, uh, for the Ridge <laughs> and Valley, because that's what it's been for everybody this year. Yep. Yep. Wally, your, your storyline that you're looking at in this week, as we head towards postseason play pretty soon. It really is. It's the idea that your eyes have to be looking ahead, but you cannot let yourself get too far ahead. You need to be focused on where you are right now, but you know, there has to be somewhere along the line and maybe that your number, one of your assistant coaches is looking ahead. They're looking at seeing who else is playing, who are the potential people we're playing and so on. There needs to be some looking ahead, but at the same token, focus has to be where you are right now. i agreed. And Tom, what you're looking for in this week. Best game of the week, River Ridge at Potosi Castle. That's, I'm, I'm very curious to see how that game goes. Since I'm not going to have to uh, keep an eye on baseball scores anymore for the rest <laughs> of the fall. Yeah, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The Twins are still playing. No, I don't care anymore. <laughs> Check it out. I mean, after all, they've just swept the Blue Jays. I'm happy for the Twins. I'm depressed about my team. Yeah. I'm sorry. Congrats on their first two wins in 18 years in the postseason. Yeah, good on them. So, uh, so, so yeah, that'll that'll wrap things up for this week's edition of the Queen Bee Radio High School Sports Roundup. Thank you to Steve, Tom, and Wally for joining me, recapping last week, previewing this week. Uh, had a great interview this week. Our one-on-one -on -one with a great one with Adam Guthrie. Um, Awesome show this week. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me. And we'll have another edition of the Queen Bee Radio High School Sports Roundup next Thursday here on YouTube and SoundCloud.